lot of things here later. Um, what they were doing was keeping track of all of these wandering stars, which is what planet means, and they correlated them with various and sundry events. If the kingdom got invaded at a particular time, um, they would look to see all the different signs and omens that were going on. One of the interesting things that I found out recently in a lecture that's actually on YouTube with one of my teachers, Lee Lehman, um, she talks about how there was recently in Egypt um, a child born with two heads, and they were born with the heads in particular positions. And if you look back in some of the oracles, uh, you will see that the Babylonians, Chaldeans, Sumerians, I forget which, but they had that written down as an oracle. And the oracle said if a child is born with two heads with, in these particular positions, then there will be um, land given up by the kingdom, something like that. And uh, apparently at that point in Egypt, I think that was when the Egypt, Egypt uh, lost the Sinai to uh, Israel's invasion. So it was really interesting to see that some of these things correlated over time. Uh, but needless to say, they had people full time looking at all of these things and finding the correlations and the omens. And this apparently is the origin for the earliest systems of astrology. Now, of course, astrology and astronomy were combined for quite some time. So really, when we're talking about ancient astronomy, we're talking about its practical application astrology. Um, there are quite a few modern astronomers who will try and tell you that, you know, um, that there were astronomers that were really forced to do horoscopes in the Middle Ages in order to keep up their studies. But actually, if you look at most of those people writing, including people like Kepler, they were looking for more exact ways to do their astrology by doing the astronomy. So in many ways, astronomy was, was the handmaiden of, of the astrological concerns. Now, we have the asterisms and we have the patterns, but how did they keep track of these things? They didn't understand orbital mechanics. What they did understand, though, was that after so many days, there would be a loop in the orbit of Mars in certain ways, and they kept track of all of those things. So they could roughly predict where a planet was going to be because of their long pattern of establishing these observations. So they knew about retrograde motion. They could see where Mars was going to be. They knew that the loop was going to be so big in the sky and that after so many days it was going to go forward. So all of these started to be handed down over time. Now, the average person was not the subject of what became the first horoscopes. Really what they were doing was looking at what was going to go on with the kingdom and of course what was going to go on with the king. Because typically the fate of the ruler was considered to be intertwined with that of the kingdom. You know, if your ruler died suddenly, you may have a crisis in the kingdom if, you know, lineage is not established well or if a coup is going to happen, whatever. So these two things were looked at, and the first horoscopes were of the king. Now, they started to establish <coughs> things more and more exactly once the zodiac was put together, and that became the belt of the 12 figures that the planets seemed to move through. Um, let me mention briefly, you will hear modern astronomers, including Neil deGrasse Tyson, say that you know astrologers have the zodiac all wrong. This is completely insulting because we've known that there are several different zodiacs, and we've known about um, motion of the spheres and all the rest for quite some time. Uh, there are actually three zodiacs. The one that you see up in the sky that has been mapped out by an astronomer in the early 20th century, actually, is called the Constellational Zodiac. That's the one where the astronomers have the nice boundaries set up in the heavens. You can look on the sky maps and all the rest. Tyson, when he says that there are 13 or 14 signs to the zodiac, is counting what the Frenchman did when Ophiuchus's foot dips down into the zodiac for maybe five degrees. <laughs> Okay, 
So it's really only useful for that sense of where is a planet in the background of stars. Now, related to that somewhat is the sidereal zodiac, which takes some starting point, uh, typically um, the first star in the nose of Aries as the beginning point, and then divides the sky up into 12 constellations, 12 signs of 30 degrees each. But even those sidereal zodiac uh, users, which are some in the West and a lot in India, actually are not taking into account that Libra is a small sign and Virgo actually takes up more space. It is looking at an archetypal form, but their argument is that this archetypal form changes by one degree every 72 years. The other zodiac that's used is the Western tropical zodiac, which starts with where the sun comes across the, um, one of the boundaries in the sky on, on about March 21st. That's a position which is tied in with archetypal forms with hot, cold, wet, and dry and everything which I had talked about last year and is intimately tied in with the cosmology of the Western esoteric tradition. Now, the thing about that is that it does shift every 72 years with the background of stars, but if you're looking at where things are in an unchanging cycle, the background of stars is simply the origin from about 2,500 years ago for the names. And we're really looking at that pattern. By the way, one of the things that if you do get an, into an argument with an astronomer or somebody who knows astronomy, um, they keep track of things in the sky by declination, which is sort of like latitude and uh, longitude, or um, latitude, rather, in, on, the, um, on the Earth's sphere. The other, the longitude, they don't take usually from the zodiac. They do something called right ascension. Fancy term, but really, if you ask them where is zero hours, zero minutes of right ascension, it is exactly the same point that astrologers in the West use to start the zodiac at Aries. And the astronomers actually have to change their maps like every 50 years. And you will see, the, when you look at an official astronomical chart, you know, of where the stars are, it will say Epoch 1950, Epoch mm. 2000, because they correct just like the astrologers do. So it's one of the arguments you can use saying, look at you guys are even using the zodiac. You're just not using it the same way. You use the same starting point. You know, you just divide it up into 24. In any case, so we get all of that. We get the stars. We get the pattern of the stars um, and where things are in a cyclic way. And then the other major element is, was discovered or found correlated with where are these things in the sky relative to their position on Earth? Are they below the horizon? Are they above the horizon? And that's where the other third thing in the sentence of astrology comes from, which is the houses. Okay? These were really formed much later. And there were a number of different house systems. The earliest is called whole sign houses. And um, you will see that whole sign houses are in a very real sense used in India and in the earliest Greek astrology. And they've actually been resurrected in modern times. A lot of astrologers are now using whole sign houses, especially since one of the top astrologers in the world, Rob Hand, has been promoting it. Um, what's the deal with the houses? Well, if a planet is just about to rise, okay, it's below the horizon, like, uh, let's take the sun, okay? An hour <laughs> before sunrise, you're starting to get a little bit more light and everything, but the sun has not shown up um, in the heavens yet. Well, that is the first house. Things have not come up yet, okay? When the sun rises, it will be in usually, depending on your system, but usually the 12th house, okay? 
And the reason why they number these things in this way is, what's the first house to rise? Boom. Then the next house, the second one, the third one to rise, the fourth. And so it goes around counterclockwise as to um, the numbering, but clockwise as to how the whole sphere of the heavens moves. Okay, Because that sphere of the heavens and that movement was critical. All right. If the moon is in the seventh house, <laughs> to quote a song, <laughs> then what that means is the moon's about to set. Okay? It's over there about to go down. Okay? Because it's in the seventh house. The whole sphere of the heavens is moving and it's about to go down. Likewise, something that's in about the tenth house is culminating. Okay, when the sun's in the tenth house, uh, it's getting pretty close to noon. When the sun is in the fourth house, directly opposite, it's close to midnight. All right, and then we have all of our dif differences with modern timekeeping and everything. So what wound up happening was they started to straighten out all of this, come up with a system, and I'll go deeper into the zodiac in a little bit. And they started to say, okay, what's happening? Where are the planet's positions in relation to the horizon and all the rest when all these things happen? Oh, let's take a look at the time that the king is born and we'll do a map of the sky <laughs> for when the king is born. And then they started to see planets, movement, and all the rest. Now, what wound up happening was that system then spread east and west. You will hear and talk to people in the Vedic tradition, Indian astrology, who will say, oh, our astrology is, you know, 5,000 years old or something like this. Well, not exactly. Because if you translate the very first book, that the earliest book we have in the Hindu tradition, it translates as the book of Greek astrology. <laughs> okay. Why? Because there was quite a bit of travel back and forth between these sides. Now, keep in mind, in India, things did develop after that in very different directions. But they mostly kept the whole sign houses. They kept with the sidereal zodiac, where they have to keep adjusting that. And of course, there were fights as to how much you adjust <laughs> for, for every few years. So there are astrologers that use one system versus another in India. And then they had whole complex systems otherwise. Uh, but they also have a really wonderful, if you talk to an Indian astrologer, oftentimes they're really, really good at prediction. Sometimes they are scary good. You can come in, at, I've heard stories of going into an Indian astrologer, telling them your birth data, and they come back and they tell you the names of your kids. <laughs> you know, this is, this is really, <laughs> this is a level we quite, haven't quite met in the West yet. But, uh, but they have other systems of prediction that are used in the West. And I'll go a little bit into that as to what happened. So this stuff traveled to the East, traveled to the West, landed in Greece. And you know the earliest Greek writings that we have um, do not reflect any understanding of astrology. It really did come in later. I think, uh, and this is where my memory is a little shaky, it may be around 300 BC, something like that. <coughs> so the big flowering of Greek civilization occurred, and later on we get astrology being kind of pasted onto that from the people doing their travels and all the rest. But the Greeks really ran with it, and they started to codify things. And we do have some of those writings, which are fortunately starting to be translated, a good number of them translated into, um, into modern languages. Uh, now. What wound up happening was the Greek astrologers set up things. They had their way of seeing things, which was totally imbued with their philosophy of the time. And what wound up happening was one particular person, one particular group of writings, managed to survive the best to be looked at and to be studied in the West. And that was a guy named, any takers? Ptolemy, okay? 
he had his four books on astronomy or four books on astrology. Now, what wound up happening was this stuff got grabbed by the Arabs, was worked with. The Greek stuff was grabbed by the Arabs also. The Arabs did a wonderful job of holding on to the tradition and translating things. And as many of you know, a lot of the Greek writings would have been lost if it hadn't been for Arab translations and preservation. But what wound up happening was, especially in later times and in the 19th and 20th century, uh, Ptolemy was about it for astrology. And there were people that were just total Ptolemy loyalists and read sometimes bad translations and misunderstood things. For one thing, Ptolemy was a really great chronicler of information, but it does not look like he was much of a working astrologer. The other thing is, he never even mentioned what a planet in a sign means. Okay? In modern astrology books, you'll get, you know, moon in Scorpio means this and whatnot. Uh, no, Ptolemy didn't even mention any of that stuff. Okay? As a matter of fact, the astrology that's done nowadays is actually somewhat more related to a watered-down version of a contemporary of his called Vettius Valens. Okay? Now, if you want to really start from the beginning, someone has just done a translation and put it up on the net of Vettius Valens, if you look him up. And uh, they did a great job of that. There have, about 15, 20 years ago, there were other translations of Vettius that astrologers have done. Uh, but it's nice to get some other versions of that out. And you get a lot more of what looks like modern astrology from some of that. Yeah? Can I just interject real quick? I uh, talked about Vettius Valens uh, earlier uh, this week because he's also the earliest source for RGs of the planetary hours. Sure. That, that's where that comes from. Yeah, yeah, and, and the planetary hours are critical with the Chaldean order, which I'll get into. Cool. Um, so, all of this stuff preserved by the Arabs, we still have some of the wonderful stuff that the Arabs wrote, which was then translated into Latin, okay, and became some of the flowering of astrology in the West when the Arabs invaded and took over the Iberian Peninsula, and then all of that uh, knowledge was starting to move into the West along with things like um, geomancy and their systems of medicine, which I always thought it was interesting that during the Crusades, the Crusaders noticed that some of the same fighters were back much quicker on the battlefield than a lot of the Western Christian fighters, mostly because the Arabs had better medicine <laughs> and got them recovered and back to battle sooner. They took note of these things. And once things settled down, a lot of that knowledge, especially the, the medical stuff, started to flow into the West. So um, now let's take a look at, if I'm continuing to follow my outline here, uh, hoping to get through all of this. Um, the medieval Renaissance worldview. One of the critical things that you will see, of course, is geocentrism. The idea that the Earth is at the center of the universe, or at least of the solar system. Um, there was once a, I think it was a graduate astronomy student who said, so, who somebody was saying something about geocentrism, and the graduate student disparagingly said, yes, they were so stupid back then. <laughs> At which point an aged astronomer said, yes, I wonder what the universe would look like from that viewpoint. At which point he was really shooting down the guy because that was the observation viewpoint. It was the logical way to look at things. And yes, a lot of people will disparage current astrology for being geocentric, but we're living on the Earth, folks. We're looking at the correlations of what's going on from our viewpoint. One of the other little uh, secrets that you won't be told is that when NASA is planning on shooting off a rocket and going somewhere, they have to do geocentric astronomy 
because they're shooting the rocket off from the Earth. <laughs> okay. Their mathematics has to take that into account. They're not blasting off from the sun. So, you know, it's all in your viewpoint, which was, of course, later reflected by Einstein, but that's ahead of time. So, what is it that they saw from that viewpoint on the Earth? Well, they thought the Earth was basically immovable. And they did know that the Earth was round and that the Earth was a ball. That is one of the things that modern, especially American history teachers are incorrect about because the knowledge of the Earth being round has been known since ancient times, if nothing else because of the shadow of the Earth on, on the moon during lunar eclipses. But be that as it may, um, the celestial sphere was seen as moving around and that there were various spheres in between the sphere of the stars and the Earth. So what do we have there? Well, in the grossest sense, we have the upper airs were thought to be fiery. Well, you got the sun up there and you got these things that are shining and the most common source for light was something that was burning. So we have air, or we have fire up there. Then we have air, obviously because you had the winds and, and the clouds. Then next came the sphere of water which sat upon the earth. So you have the, uh, um, each of those four then becomes reflective of the four elements. And interestingly enough, uh, for those of you who might be wandering into the realm of geomancy, that's also the order <coughs> that the little dots are seen in geomantic divination. But we have those spheres, uh, the lithosphere, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, and the um, ionosphere in modern scientific parlance, okay? And they're trying to make sense of all this. So what's next right above the Earth? Well, there was the wind, the clouds, and all the rest, but you obviously saw the moon going around. So you have Earth here. You have the moon is the next thing up, okay? And then it got a little bit complicated. Ah, get that later. It got a little bit complicated, but they saw the next thing out from the Earth, the moon, as being Mercury, the next sphere out, Venus, and then came the Sun. Then came Mars. Then came Jupiter, and finally Saturn. Now, each of these had a number of years or months that they went around. The moon obviously taking some 28 days, depending on how you look at it and what angles. Um, Mercury and Venus were closely tied in with the sun, but sometimes they could get around a little quicker. The sun then taking 365 and a quarter days. Mars about a year and a half, Jupiter 12 years, and Saturn 29 years. Now, I know that some people here are familiar with Kabbalah, and I'd like you to look at this diagram of the spheres and notice if you were to take the 10 Sephira, what planets are related to each of the spheres on the Sephira? It's the same pattern. Yeah. Same pattern. We get all the way up to Jina in the third, and then you get to transcendent types of things. So yet another point where this pattern is found. And as Bill mentioned earlier, this is the same pattern that's used to determine the planetary hours. So this is one of the critical things. It also apparently is the order of initiation in the Mithraic mysteries. Okay, because you have planetary initiations and you were working your way up the spheres as you were ascending your soul to a higher level. So all of this stuff, you know, if you just know this one fact, <coughs> it can point to a lot of other things in the tradition. Question? Uh, yeah, um, regarding that organization, um, there is a discrepancy though in where you place uh, Saturn and Luna uh, between the Paldean and the Ptolemaic uh, order. How would you uh, reconcile that? 
in, let's just say, initiatic terms? Um, you know, it's interesting because if, if, you, if you look at all of this, um, I don't know, I've been so imbued with the tree of life, <laughs> you know? That's how we all. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's the best way for me to look at it. Um, you know what, that's really good. I'm, let me look that up and I'll tell you next year if you have me back. <laughs> all right, okay? That's, that's a, a really good point and I'll admit to ignorance on thinking about that. But it, it'll be a good stretch for me. All right. All right. Um, so, finding this pattern imbued in a lot of different places, um, we now get to okay. So, just briefly, what do these planets mean? Okay. Some of what they mean has to do with their patterns in hot and cold. Okay. Um, just briefly, planets that were closer to the sun were thought to be a little bit warmer. Okay, Mars, not. <coughs> Jupiter still somewhat, Saturn really cold because it was the furthest away. Okay, the moon was thought of as being damp and moist. You know, um, Mercury, as always, a little bit of each and a little bit of everything. You know. So a lot of these patterns and a lot of the meanings were connected up with some of those very elemental forms. All right. So what, in, if you look in modern astrology books, you will see that the planets have certain attributes, but they're largely psychological. All right. We'll get into why it became psychological in a while. But if you look at the older books, like if you get a copy of Lily, all right, you will see that these things have attributes. They, there were long lists of correspondences with these planets. From there, you kind of get a sense of what the planet means. But they were looking at much more concrete applications for the planets and indeed the signs of the zodiac. You know, that this rules this, that this metal is connected with this. You know, you get everything from, uh, oh, what is it? Uh, just for metals, it's lead for Saturn, tin for Jupiter, and by the way, nobody can find any tin. I don't know. They closed the last tin mine, I think, in uh, in uh, England just recently. So I, I just don't know where to get a hold of tin anymore. eBay. Uh, eBay. <laughs> yeah, maybe. No, 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 seriously. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll have to look. Mars for iron. The sun for gold. Venus for copper, Mercury, of course, Mercury, and the moon is usually attributed to silver. But there are other things that are connected in too. So that's just a simple correspondence. 